to us thus far in the Book of Romans. We are thankful to learn of um, your universal love for all that, all those that come to your Son Jesus Christ, and we want to uh, pray for this evening. Lord, that our hearts will be receptive to what is going to be taught to us. A uh, lot that will also be dependent upon your Holy Spirit to um, truly understand the treasures of your gospel. And for these things, we pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joshua. I have found your um, I have found your screen so confusing because it's the, the bright sunny day and the time zones and just it just gets me all turned around upside down because <laughs> it's neither bright like that here nor I think is it bright like that there. <laughs> so anyway, I know you've got a you've got a background set. It still plays with the mind. Um, a couple of uh, a, a couple of just logistical details here or. Anyway, administrative details as far as things go. Uh, we've got a time coming up here. Well, I can here I can show it to you in the Google Classroom, I believe. Um, and I made an adjustment to the schedule because something came together. Uh, there's a, a teacher, um, and it's Dr. Glenn Kerr, who is with Bibles International. Anyway, he agreed to do a session with us um, that I think will be I think it'll be very interesting to all of us. Uh, so he, I've seen him do translation consulting in the past where he will work through a text together with a team of translators. The fun thing here, uh, I was watching him do that translating cons translation consulting in the Philippines, and so he was translating into Tagalog. Um, so anyway, it was fun to watch that, but uh, just because of kind of seeing both sides as it went by. Um, but he will be doing that lecture for uh, doing a lecture for us in a week, I believe it is. Um, I'm just looking at our schedule and I'll try to put this share this to the screen as well here. Uh, we're today on lecture 11 and so you'll have one more time with me doing a lecture and then the time after that here is translational challenges with him. So um, that's that, and I think that's going to be a fun lecture because what he'll do is he'll talk through, first of all, kind of a general language or translation philosophy. What are Bibles International, what are they doing when they come in and do a translation process overall? And then going from that into what are some of the specific issues that come up in Romans that become hard to translate into other languages. Um, and I, anyway, I think it'll be a very different and fun lecture. And then that actually carries us out the rest of the way. So uh, here's today, and then we will continue uh, one more here. Um, because this got bumped, I'll try to finish more of the exegesis exposition here. So we'll have a little bit less time for final questions, but I still would like your questions. Uh, please submit those or send those. Um, I've gotten some of those already. So I'll do the best that I can with those. And then the last two lectures will be finished out with Dr. Oberlin in chapter 14 and some issues in chapter 16 with uh, Dr. Chi. So, so that's kind of where that's going. And I want you to be aware of where that's headed up. Um, okay. And for today, we're going to do our, our best to walk through Romans 8 and 9. Um, and I don't feel as much of a heavy burden to get every point in chapters 9 through 11, just because technically Dr. Collins did cover a lot of that in his lecture, though, I mean, anyway, there's always more to be said with that. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. One other thing to mention here is that uh, I would ask for homework. I didn't give you a particular, a particular reading for today, um, but I would like to ask you if for your homework you will do an extended reading and I'm going to give you an, ex an assignment, a reading assignment, uh, and it's the, from The King and His Beauty by Thomas Schreiner, uh, just doing the theology of Romans just from that. And it'll be, it'll be a longer reading. Um, if you've already read that, then the alternative that I could give you would be Thielman, and it's also from his, his, uh, his biblical theology. So if you'll read one of those, those are going to be longer assignments, but I think those would give you a helpful overview of the book, and uh, you're not going to regret the time working on it. But um, if you'll do that for your homework reading for last time and for this time, and I can get the excerpt of one of those 
up as a PDF if you don't have access to the book. So I can get that up there uh, just after the lecture today. All right, if you have questions about that, let me know. So um, as part of getting into that, uh, or getting into the lecture today, I was thinking about kind of trying to recover an overall summary framework for the book. And I have found interesting as we've gone forward step by step that we have some, some really strong summary statements where you can almost do the theology of the book through just a handful of summary statements. And here's what I'm talking about. I'll just read through these and I think this will give you the sense of kind of how you can just you can talk your way through the book through a handful of verses, actually. Uh, as a key introduction into the question of the book, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. I mean, that's such a tight summary of the themes of the book. Uh, and I, I hope you appreciate even more. I appreciate more having worked through some of this now, I appreciate even more how tight that is, right? I mean, because you have the gospel, uh, you have salvation, believing, the inclusive thing, Jew and Greek, which I it, we get into some today with chapter nine, righteousness of God and the whole justify language, faith to faith, and here the righteous shall live by faith. It's really tight. I mean, it's almost like every word is thematic. Verse 18, introducing us to the problem of one to three, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And so you go through one through three. You conclude out one through three. This is extended. I probably should have trimmed this down. But, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to receive, be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be righteous and the righteousifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And um, of course, again, I, you know, I could probably focus in on the first two verses and the last verse, but a really tight summary of the themes. That takes us into the conclusion, kind of the joyful conclusion. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Or eight, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then I'm jumping ahead to what I'm going to talk about today, later. It is not as though the word of God has failed. That without context, maybe it doesn't stand alone without context like some of the others, but it summarizes, uh, I think some of the commentators will say, it's like a thesis statement for chapters 9 through 11. Because the problem of chapters 9 through 11, have God's promises failed? If Israel has rejected, does that show that God's promises or his word has not come through? And the answer to that question leads then to the, the turn of the book, kind of the turning point from more theological focus to more practical focus. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship or your reasonable service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may prove or discern what is the will of God? What is good, acceptable, and perfect? Okay, I think then, my point being, in a handful of verses, you can talk your way through and kind of follow the flow or logic of the book. And that hits us to uh, where we are today to talk about chapter 8. And uh, my plan is to try to get through all of chapter 8 and all of chapter 9, and and then I, th I think we're going to run out of time from there. <laughs> um, for starters, I will recover just one thing that we hit right at the end of our time last time, which was talking about chapter eight, the already not yet. I do want to make sure that you are familiar with the concept of the already not yet. I looked at the, the video, the transcript, or my just the recording of the lecture from before, and I realized I never really explained my idea. I just assumed it. Um, so it's, a, it's an idea that I hope you're familiar with, but if you're not, I, I want to make sure that you are. 
the already not yet concept from Paul is that we have already benefited or we've already started to experience some of the blessings of eternity and those blessings are brought forward into the present. Um, this will be an interesting, I've never thought about making this link and I don't know that it's anyway, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable link and it's a fair link. So I'll do, I'll do it. Um, and then we can talk about whether, whether you think it's, it's a valid comparison or not, but I'm going to jump to John and it's, so it's very, very much outside of Paul. Um, but I think maybe the thought of it is the same idea. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, so let's try this. This is interesting. Um, what I'm showing you here is a diagram that I've used when I'm working in Revelation. It's the letters to the seven churches. Um, so with the letters to the seven churches, you have here, you know, here are the letters, uh, Ephesus, Myrna, Pergamon, so, so forth. On one side of each one of the letters, you have the words of him who, I won't go into that, but that taps into chapter one, the description of Jesus. So it, in, in Revelation seven, it's gonna go, or Revelation one, it's gonna go through uh, the words of the one who has eyes like a flame of fire, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the words of him who walks among the seven candlesticks. So that's the side of that. The other side of it is, to the one who conquers, I will give. And over here on this side of it, it's talking about blessings that he's going to give in the future. Um, so over things over here are things like I will make him to sit down with me on my throne, even as I sat down with my father on his throne. I will grant him eternal life. I will I will give him new life. Um, so it's this, and I think what's interesting these you can draw this side from the end of each one of the letters. These are these are appearing chapter two, chapter two, chapter two, uh, chapter three, chapter three, chapter three, chapter three. Okay, but each one of these references has links to the end of the book. And part of what I think is interesting about the letters is the letters then reach backwards to chapter 1 and they reach forward to chapters 19 to 22 and they pull the blessings in. And so it kind of gives you this sense of because you are going to receive eternal blessings like reigning with Jesus Christ forever and ever, live now in the light of that. Live now in the light of the future. Live light now in the light of eternity. That's related, I think, to the Pauline concept of the already not yet. The concept of this goes, it's as if you're already living in and enjoying some of the blessings of eternity now. Or um, another way to say it, the, the future has invaded the present. God has reached into the future and brought some of that forward into now. Um, if I think of the resurrection as a future coming event, it is. Jesus Christ's resurrection is a getting started early. He's the first fruits. But the, the framework for it goes, I'm already enjoying some of that future life now. It's already happening to me now. And that I, that's the logic that's flowing all the way through chapter one. The logic of chapter one goes that the blessings of the future have already invaded the present. So we're already enjoying, kind of, we're getting started early. The rest of creation waits. We go ahead and get started early because we already enjoy some of this. And you can see that language or that concept at the front end of Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation. Where here this is present oriented and you can look through and you can see the concepts that he's talking about here. You enjoy life now. You enjoy the blessings now by life. You enjoy eternal life or you enjoy the life that Jesus brings now. Um, that is in the light of the reality that right now the rest of creation is already is groaning, waiting. Okay, so it's subjected to futility, it's bondage to corruption, the whole creation is groaning, we're waiting, but the, the creation is waiting specifically for the glory that is to be revealed. And the rest of this section talking about that glory, basically the hope that's coming, the confidence of the redemption of our bodies, our resurrection, and so forth. So you have the two halves in Romans 8. 
you have already enjoyed or experienced some of this life, you are in Christ Jesus. You have life. You have peace with God, other side. And yet we still struggle. And we still age and we still die. Um, so there's a part of us that is enjoying this already early. And there's another part of us that's waiting in hope and in anticipation. The sense that we already have life now is getting started early because of this already not yet concept that stands across Romans as kind of a core part of Romans. So anyway, I, it's, it's important to get the concept because as you chase it through Paul, you're going to see it everywhere. And it really is a key to understanding some of the concept in this. Yes, right. I mean, I'm seeing the chat, seeing in the chat here, uh, we have eternal life now. Um, at the same time that we're, of course, waiting for resurrection. So there's, it's kind of, a, it's part of the paradoxical concept of this. Uh, and some people have even, you know, put into this, like we are living paradoxes. We don't, we don't belong in our context because, I mean, all around us, you know, and we were dying people and broken people. A part of us now has been transformed. A part of us has now been resurrected. A part of us still struggles. So we're living paradoxes. And part of the Romans 7 tension is tied up, I think, in that. That we don't, we're kind of creatures that don't make sense in a way. We're in this process of transformation. And hence the struggle. Hence, hence some of the difficulty that happens as we seek to live life in the spirit. Okay. Um, a couple of notes here. And I'll try to keep this so it's not feeling like just a, a running commentary as we go. But things that I think are worth noting. Uh, so if you walk through here, you're going to see life and the spirit throughout. That's linked to Ezekiel 37. But all of the new covenant passages are going to talk about life and spirit. The Ezekiel 37 passage is here, and it's the dry bones passage, um, which is to say it's part of the prophecy that you have linked to the spirit the spirit will bring about i will i will put breath in you you will live the spirit is breathed out like adam and remember god breathed into his body and he became a living soul i will put breath in you my spirit in you so prophesy say to the breath here's the wind the wind comes and life happens and it's a great army the dry bones live and so then the prophecy goes, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. I will place you in your own land and you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, I will do it. That language is linked here now to Romans 8 when you get the law of the spirit of life and the freedom that that spirit brings. So the, the spirit that brings life is the, the concept that's being tracked in here throughout. Um, and finally, the last thing I'm just saying in the first part of here down through verse four, uh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but according to the spirit. Just a last comment from these first four verses that it's talking about Jesus payment for our sin in kind of the fulfillment of the Romans 3, 25 sort of idea, uh, 21 through 26, that God can be just and the justifier. The righteousness, righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled by the power of the Spirit, pointing ahead also to Christ is the end of the law in Romans 10. The law is fulfilled. We have peace with God. There is now no condemnation, but it's, it's fulfilled by imputation, Jesus Christ doing this on our behalf. Okay, um, so I'm going to jump to the next section, and I, I think whatever else we talked about that sufficiently uh, last time. But I'm going to jump to the next section, which is uh, verses 5 through 11. And let's just look at those now. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death. To set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. The mind that is sound in the flesh is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of God does not belong in him. Spirit of Christ 
does not belong in him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I, I do think just what I was talking about, the Ezekiel 37 background kind of gives life. It kind of gives substance to the section to, to understand that concept, okay, the spirit as life giver, and now, you, oh, okay, the spirit, life giver, I get it. Uh, here, Christ as the resurrection setting the way, the spirit even is, is the, the way that his resurrection is brought about, uh, an Ephesians 1 and 2 idea. So, you know, God made Jesus Christ alive, therefore God will make you alive. And those, those concept are, concepts are linked. But I think critical to getting this whole section is back to that already not yet idea again that it, that, that Romans 8 is predicting my resurrection my physical resurrection is in my body rising again it's predicting my physical resurrection but in light of the fact of the physical resurrection the already not yet concept of that brings in the whole expectation of my now living faithfully so I'm already enjoying the future resurrection in a sense because I already enjoy life, right? I'm already having life lived out within me. Um, so a couple of things to comment about this section or just to concepts to get here. Uh, one, you'll notice in this section, you're gonna have mind all the way through. Um, so, oops, got the wrong window. The concept of mind all the way through this uh, section um, yeah here it is so those who are in the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit to set the mind on the flesh is death to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace the mind sound of the flesh is hostile to God um, so you could talk about that in terms of um, you know that like the intellectual apprehension of the gospel Kind of how do you like an ephesians 4 idea how do i change my life how do i change my behavior change my thinking i uh, i think you can go beyond that and here's why um okay i got a wrong word here i don't know why hmm i'd have to check into that anyway um here's an, a pattern across um multiple uh i don't know hmm all right a pattern across multiple passages that are going to do this think Okay, I know why it's doing it. I, I think I get it. Um, but not to think of yourself a certain way. Um, here, to agree with one another. Being of the same mind. Have this mind in yourself. Uh, let those who are mature think this way. Agree in the Lord. Set your minds on things that are above. I think you can get from these passages because these are all using the same word of that thinking or that mind idea. I don't think it's just intellectual. I, mean, I think it's attitudinal it's it's actually whole person so for him to say those who have this mind it's it's really this character this person this nature so i do think it's not just strictly intellectual it's the whole person the whole way of life um and the way the word is used like in the passages i get just gave you kind of shows i think the breadth of the way it can be used like that okay so there's that um, second thing, and this actually relates to the question that uh, Pastor Perry asked just a second ago, and that is the in the spirit language. So let's look at that language for a second. Just kind of notice that uh, here, those who live in the court and those who live according to the flesh, uh, according to the spirit. Um, so to be, I think the King James is going to translate this in the flesh. Uh, well, it's down here, verse nine, in the flesh, but in the spirit. Um, and so forth. If Christ is in you, etc. So in the flesh, in the spirit. And here's the, here's the comment I want to make on here just to clarify something. Um, very important to, to adjust our language a little bit. It, it, it becomes kind of Christianese or it is part of Christianese to talk about I was in the flesh. I was in the spirit. Um, and I think that language is probably tracked back to here. And I would say that's a wrong use of that language. I would say that's a distortion of the passage. Because if you're looking at the, the concept of the passage, what he's actually saying is to be in relationship 
with the Spirit or to be in the Spirit, parallel to union with Christ. So you're in the Spirit, i.e. also the Spirit is in you. Oneness with the Spirit, parallel to being in Christ. If you are a believer, you are in the Spirit and permanently so. It's not like a I go in and out thing. So, you know, like uh, five minutes ago, I was doing poorly. I was angry, had a sin problem. I was in the flesh. Five minutes from now, I'm doing better. Now I'm in the spirit. That's like saying I'm in um, under condemnation and then suddenly now I'm in Christ. Then I'm back under condemnation. Then I'm back in Christ. Like I'm going back and forth between status of regeneration or not. And it doesn't work. So go back and let's look at the language of the passage again. You, however, fact, statement of fact, you are, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And why I say that being in the spirit is actually parallel language to in Christ. If Christ is in you, because the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of Jesus, because of righteousness. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So the spirit dwells in you. Christ is in you. It's linking back like to the language uh, back here for those who are in Christ Jesus or therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it's our relationship with Christ, our union with Christ to be therefore in the spirit in this kind of sense, in the, excuse me, in the spirit is to be a believer. To be in the flesh is to be an unbeliever. And I would say that whole way of using the language, well, I said that, but I said it in the flesh or something. Um, that whole way of using that language, I think is off. Correct me if, if, if uh, you have support to say otherwise, um, and I'm happy to happy to be corrected like that. But I think that whole way of language is used is off anyway, in as much as we draw it from this passage to say like it's a passing thing. Sometimes you're in the flesh, sometimes you're in the spirit. No, if you're a Christian, you're in the spirit. Just that's the spirit is in you. You're in the spirit, period. But it's not like a come go thing. Um, I think that's worth adjusting our, our language on and kind of getting that set up correctly. Uh, the spirit is parallel to union with Christ helped me to understand some of what's going on because generally we talk about the spirit in us. The concept of us in the spirit seems um, counterintuitive somehow. So recognizing the spirit in us as parallel to union with Christ, I think gave me some categories to put it in that, that helped me think of it a little better. Uh, one other comment in this section in relation to, to union with Christ or union with the spirit idea, I think it's really interesting. Notice in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, and the reason I'm commenting on that, it's just interesting. It illustrates, I mean, it, it supports what I said earlier about union with the spirit is union with Christ. But I think it does more than that. It supports even a Trinitarian theology. Um, noticing the fact that he can just speak between the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ. I mean, these are parallel, right? The spirit of God, a moment later, the spirit of Christ, a moment later, Christ is in you. And you could go through and have a little bit of an identity crisis. Wait, who are we talking about here? Clarify this for me. Are we talking about the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, or Christ himself? And basically the passage goes, yeah. Right. I mean, there's so there's some Trinitarian, um, what's the word? I'm, equivocation happening here. Equivocation moving between different expressions because the expressions are all, they're all sayable. They're all doable. Um, all of those work. And I, I think that's fascinating in terms of uh, Trinitarian theology. Okay, um, last thing to say about this section before I move on. If you just notice the life and death language of that of this section. So, you know, to be in Christ, the body, to be in Christ, you are alive in him. To not be in Christ, you're dead. And the parallel or kind of the, the tension or the, the pull between those things. Okay, that language of life is pointing ahead. I'm 
talked about a little bit ago already, to resurrection later in the passage. So how about I can do this one? Um, we'll try live or life or dead, and we'll do range for this section. Okay, so if you're walking through this section, then you get this emphasis strongly here, right? The spirit of life has set you free. Those who live, live, live life. Although the body is dead, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Him who raised Jesus from the dead, he will also give life to your mortal bodies. Okay, and so therefore we are to live this way. We're to live according to the spirit. Um, if you go further in the passage, you're going to get into the section just a bit later where he's going to be talking about resurrection and the hope of resurrection. So we're moving into an eschatological reality. And what I just want you to grasp or see, here's the eschatological side of the passage. The sufferings of the present time don't even compare with the glory that is to be revealed. What I want you to see is you've got really interesting time frame reference between the first part and the second part. The first part of the chapter versus we'll say 1 to 17. Um, the section up to that, are it's talking about our present reality. You are alive. You have become alive. And so that, that present reality, you have life, just bleeds right into the future reality. You will have life. And the future eschatology resurrection, you're going to enjoy life in the future, is just derived right out of the present. Um, or I can just take life and I can drive it through all three time frames for Paul to say, you came to life past, you are alive now, you will live future eternity, eschatology, resurrection. And I think those three themes or those three patterns, you can drive it through all three of those time frames. And it is illustrating, again, this kind of already not yet concept that uh, the, the future reality, reality bleeds into the present. And just overlaps right through. Um, the concept, I mean, that already not yet even is drawing in, and there's elements here, even in the first section that is more present, that is already starting to highlight kind of a future thing. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of life, is, it, the spirit is life because of righteousness. I mean, the body is dead. That language is used there to talk about the physical body. The body is dying, and you can see the body wearing down. But the, the concept of it goes, even as the body wears down, you know that you have. It's both future. You will be resurrected, but you even have life, even as your body wears down, even as you die. Uh, there's a paradox in that here. A believer dies, and yet they have life. It's guaranteed. And those things are still there, still happening. Okay, uh, that takes me to talk about one concept or like a, a theological kind of idea. And uh, that is the concept of the adoption. So here, I'll show you the problem first, and then let's explore it just a little bit. Here's the problem. Um, is adoption a present thing or a future thing? Meaning, do I say I have been adopted or I will be adopted. So here are two passages right within Romans 8 that do both. Uh, here, Romans 8, 15. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Abba, Father. So have I received adoption? I mean, you can, you can get really mm, precise here and say something like, no, we've received the spirit of adoption. I'm going to just read this still. I mean, it's as far as my reading of it, I look at this and I say, we have received adoption. The spirit that guarantees adoption, okay. But, I mean, anyway, the argument of it goes, you did not receive the spirit of slavery, and that's why you're not facing this fear. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons. You are sons. So you cry out, Abba, Father, because you have already been adopted, is a way of saying it. And if I go elsewhere in Paul... I'll get this kind of idea. Uh, so here, the Jesus Christ is incarnation to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Ephesians 1, 5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Um, and the, the adoption concept 
just means becoming a son. So, I mean, that, that is, we, we have a close enough cultural idea anyway. So somebody who was not a son becomes a son. And how, they, how does that happen? Adoption is how that happens. The problem or the tension that you have here is later on in the chapter, verse 23, it's future. Uh, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. So, I mean, I get the overall impression from verse 15 that we have received adoption. We are sons. I, I, that's another way of asking it. Are we children of God right now? Um, John, first John is going to answer very clearly, beloved, we are God's children now. Okay, first John 3, 1, I think it is. We are God's children now. Are we God's children? Yes. Okay, then we are adopted. We have received adoption. So, what is he saying here to say we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies? Here it sounds like it's present. Here it sounds like it's future. So much here that I think, um, because this is maybe the more explicitly clear statement, uh, there are people who will say adoption, they're going to narrow it down. Adoption is a future thing, period, end of discussion. And so you can go back through all of the passages and you can kind of, read 23 verse 23 back through them to say that adoption is purely and strictly a future thing um when i was part of my in part of my ordination and um different interviews and things like that uh this is a question i was asked and i i knew the answer just within my setting i knew that the answer was going to be future adoption is future and at that point that was my understanding and i was good with that um keeping on studying, I think there's something more complex going on here. Um, and so I, I think if you, the, the reason I say that is just to say there, there are people, really good people that will feel, feel very strongly adoption is future, period. Um, I think there's complexity to it because I, I think it's back to that already not yet thing. And if I understand adoption correctly, my understanding of adoption is just Adoption is becoming a son. That's it. It's we we overcomplicate it. I think it's just over. It just means becoming a son. Okay. So I am already a son of God. I have been made a child of God because He has made me His child. Present already. There's a component of adoption that has already happened for me. But then the component that we saw in that that later passage, the future component of, of adoption is to say, yes, there's a component I'm also waiting for. In the same way that we would say something like, have I, have I received eternal life? And we kind of go, well, yes and no. I mean, I'm still going to die, right? And so it's not that at the present I say, like, oh, yeah, I'll never face death. I will face death. I mean, if Jesus doesn't return, I will face death. And yet I can talk about myself as having eternal life. Right? Why? In some aspects I already have, in some aspects I'm still waiting. There's a future and a present. So I think that's the way I want to think of, about adoption. Adoption is already present in a way. And it is also future in another way. Um, if you're interested in thinking more about adoption, I found it really helpful here. This is the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology. And they have a short article. It would take you, I don't know, 10 minutes or something to read. But I thought, thought it was helpful. Something that goes around and around with adoption is, uh, is, it, is the background Greek, Roman, Jewish. And depending on whether you understand it as like a, a Roman background or a Jewish background, it shifts your understanding. Because um, you, can, you can do different ways. Does it mean that I become a son or does it mean like the bar mitzvah sort of idea? Um, but I think the strongest way to understand it is just Old Testament, but in the sense of it simply refers to being made God's son. So the pattern of that follows the same pattern that you get with tracking like the son of God language. And if you track the Son of God language, you're going to get the pattern that God made Israel his son. Later, God talks about the Davidic king being his son. A close relationship with uh, Dr. Minnick connected this in with like the image of God. We have the, the relationship with God broken, but sonship restores it. Later, the ultimate fulfillment, you are my son today, I have begotten thee. Um, so 
linking in with the Messiah, the Messianic King. Already it begins to be linked in with the Spirit through that kind of concept because the Messiah is going to, he, he, is, he is God's Son, the Son. Then he also is full of the Spirit. And so then in the New Testament, we get the full explanation, including the fact that believers now enjoy, enjoy adoption. So anyway, it, I, to me, this was sort of liberating because I think I've, I've struggled around and around with adoption and different views of adoption and people really honestly complicating it quite a bit. Um, if I just will put into the category, adoption being, means becoming a son of God or being a son of God, being God's son then uh, a lot of pieces are, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to read. Um, and here I'm just pulling this paragraph from that article in the Dictionary of Biblical Theology. For Paul, it is God's unique son, Jesus Christ, who has made believers adoption as God's children possible. Um, I would be glad to go further down this, but it, it's the idea Jesus is the son of God, the sui generis, the only one like that. Jesus is the absolute son of God. Union with Christ means you also are a son of God because you're united with him and he is the son. Now you are a son. So my union with Christ is the basis for my becoming a son. That has made God's children or made adoption as God's children possible. I can be one of God's children because of this fact. That adoption takes place through their spirit-mediated identification with Christ. It entails participation in God's restored people as heirs of God in Christ in the blessings and benefits of the promised time of eschatological salvation. And now I think I, I kind of get the answer to the problem that we had earlier, which is how I can already be adopted and I can also be waiting for adoption. It is both present and future. The answer to that is just coming here. In this sense, I'm already enjoying some of this ahead of time. And this sense up here is the full flowering of it. The full flowering when I experience the fullness of my adoption. And I, I, the, the eschatological sense of adoption being complete total. Okay, um, yeah. All right, if you have questions or comments about that, I'm happy to uh, continue with that a bit more, but otherwise I'll keep on moving. That helped me, just helped me understand um, the whole concept of adoption that I think to that point had eluded me or just frustrated me. It just seemed complicated before. Um, so I'll, I'll move to the next section and um, I would like to highlight just in terms of, I'll just show you a couple of colors that are going to start sticking out here and this starts to highlight some of our themes. Um, so how about a couple of things here? Do you remember, okay, see the green here? All right, so do you remember if you go back to, uh, here it is, chapter six, we would be enslaved to sin, set free, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, set free, slaves, slaves. Okay, so this slave metaphor was all over the place in chapter six, the slavery concept. I thought it was interesting when I come forward again to chapter 8, it returns again, comes back. You did not receive the spirit of slavery. Down here, though, in this part of the passage, it's now actually, es oops, it's now es actually eschatological. It's freedom from slavery, but it's freedom from slavery viewed in terms of the future. The creation will be set free from its bondage to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So, I mean, it's interesting that he can use the same metaphor, chapter 6, for the present. You are free. You have been set free. You are no longer under bondage. And he just jumps forward. And here now we're in eschatology. And he's talking about you. The creation is set free from bondage. Um, and the two are linked. So we've got that same already not yet thing going on. And you can see the shift here. Look now, notice the red underline, the creation, 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 um, and that's it. So the creation language through there is, it, it is illustrating again my idea that uh, in the verses up to this point, 1 to 17, we're talking about the believers, chapter, verse 18 forward, we're talking about eschatology, future. But he actually has shifted his focus. He's, he's broadened it out. 
And he's talk not talking now not just about believers, but he's talking about the whole creation. And then he's going to go back. If, if you un notice the blue underlining, it's saints, those who, those who, those, 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 um, us, 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 we, we. Okay. So anyway, it's going to shift from back here in verses 1 to 17 up here. We are in this status. We have life to talking about the creation and what happens to the creation. And then it shifts back to us. It's talking about us again. And uh, a comment to make about that here. I think part of the way the logic of that works is linked all the way back to chapter five. Do you remember um, the, so the first Adam, the second Adam concept? Jesus Christ is the second Adam. The first Adam through his failure corrupts everything. So the creation itself is broken because of the first Adam and his failure. Jesus Christ restores that. And the second Adam sets things right. Um, well, I think part of what's happening in this then, in the logic of this is Jesus, or excuse me, Paul is linking, again, the fate of creation linked to this salvation dynamic. Because Jesus Christ has overcome, then the creation itself is set right. So we did realize that actually the entire creation waits for this salvation that you and I experience. Or the entire creation hangs on Adam's failure, Adam's restoration, our restoration. The whole creation is shaped and changed by that. Um, and the links between those or the resonances between those, I think, give us help. Our standing as sons, our salvation as sons, has cosmic implications. It has, imp it, it has implications for the entire physical world as well, which is really striking, I think. Okay, um, how about this theme as well? Uh, and it is noticing, I put it here in pink. Um, so verse 20, because of him who subjected it in hope, the, the creation waits in hope. Verse 24, in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is not seen is not hope. Who hopes for what he sees? If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Um, so the concept of hope, what's going on with that? Um, and you can track hope all the way through the book. I had not until just working on this, this specific uh, lecture, but it helped me appreciate. And here I'll show you. So Romans 4, Abraham hoped, he believed in against hope. Uh, 5, 2 is, a, I think, an important resonance to 8, what the passage we're working on. Um, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And character produces hope, and hope does not put to shame. So the because the context here is hope in suffering. As you suffer, there is still hope. Okay, well, that has resonance to what we're looking at because the creation is subjected to futility, but there is still hope, right? And it's it's hope that's eschatologically oriented. And then you can go through a couple of more um, rejoice in hope through the scriptures we might have hope. Here's the critical one for Romans, kind of as a summary. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And that's, that's kind of like an important programmatic summary, um, climactic type statement. So hope appearing twice in that is a significant theme or actually the driving theme for that section I think is striking. So anyway, uh, what's going on with that? And as I worked through and just looked at the components with hope, it's very, level, very parallel to faith. You know, I mean, I think we know this, uh, I can just assume this is a starting point. It's not just hope as in like, uh, you know, hopefully or I'm hoping or maybe it's as in, as in like it's a possible kind of thing. But it, it's hope in the sense of sometimes I hear, um, what is it? Confident expectation. So it's hope in the sense of confidence. In that sense, it's parallel to faith. But what I think shifted this for me or helped expand the thinking in my mind, helped me get a better understanding. Um, hope is like faith plus eschatology. In other words, I have faith in lots of things. Um, so, okay, I can have faith in the fact that Jesus came. I can have faith that God created the world. I believe, I believe by faith that God created the world. Okay. 
But hope is once you take that faith concept and you turn that future oriented. And so faith plus eschatology gives me hope. Um, and now it's, it's not just I have faith that God created the world, but it's I have faith that God will fill in the blank. Hope or faith plus eschatology. It's a will for future oriented. I think one other component, and I'm less sure about this, but I think it's fair enough. I think hope probably also moves from a present relatively more negative in the sense because I'm thinking towards eschatology, it, it, it will be good. It kind of moves from since that's going to be good, then this is less good. <laughs> Um, so I think it assumes a brokenness. In other words, when we talk about hope, it assumes that right now I'm in a more difficult situation or more adverse situation, that things are broken, but it's going to get better. No one would say something like, I have hope that the future will be exactly the same as the present. I don't view that as hope. I, I mean, I guess if you were saying, okay, you know, I don't think the disaster will destroy. So I have hope that we will continue as is. Uh, I suppose that could be a sense of hope. But I do think there's probably a concept in hope of assuming things being better in the future than they are now. In any case, I think the concept of hope then assumes the whole biblical story. It assumes the fact that now is broken because of the curse. So things are adverse relatively now because of sin, because of the curse. Because th things, another way of saying it, things are not currently as they ought to be. However, the rest of the biblical story, the story does end well. It gets interesting when you think about this, and because I don't think we, we often do. But, you know, competing truth claims about the world and worldviews and so forth. You know, you can have a dystopian ending for reality. Things are going to get bad. They're going to get awful. So now are the, the halcyon days, and then it's just going to get awful. Um, and the biblical story is to say, no, I mean, it will get awful for a period of time. But the end of the story is good, not bad. The end of the story is not the, the, the universe falling back into a black hole again. But it, the end of the story is good, and that gives them the basis for hope. And the confident expectation, the sense of faith, we believe that it will be right in a positive way. God will God will restore things. So the concept of hope then assumes that whole worldview, that whole way of working. Okay, um, I think if you will let me stretch a little bit, I'd like to finish chapter eight and then take our break, which anyway, we still technically have three minutes before we normally would anyway, but I'll stretch just a little bit into the next section and that way we can finish chapter eight. So, um, but there's not too much to do here. I would just like to highlight this first, Romans 8, 26 to 27. Oops, I need to broaden this back out. Give me a second. Okay, here we go. Um, so the Spirit also helps in our weakness. We do not know what to pray for as we ought. The Spirit himself intercedes us for us with groanings too deep for words. He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What is going on? Um, and this intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Uh, Gordon Fee and, and other interpreters similarly, uh, so continuationists, people that are going to emphasize the ongoing practice of miraculous tongues and things like that, are going to actually use this passage to describe tongues. So we might pray, and we might pray sometimes with groanings that are too deep for words. So this groanings here is going to refer to us. We're the ones groaning. Um, and the Spirit is interceding for us, with us, and these groanings that we make or that we have in the, the sense of tongues. They're things that cannot be said in normal human speech. So they're going to actually use this passage as part of support for speaking in tongues. I, of course, don't read it that way. I don't think that's even the na most natural way to read it, and there are reasons for that. Uh, some grammatical, some theological, and things like that. But what does it mean? Um, it's definitely the framework of prayer. So, I mean, that's what we're talking about, prayer. Um, we're talking about here the Spirit interceding, which is really interesting because normally we talk about Christ interceding. This is the only passage where we find the Spirit interceding. 
it's another one of those equivocation things where, you know, I have within the framework of the Trinity, I expect, okay, Christ does this. And then I find, oh, actually the spirit. And you can, you can take something that Christ does, but you can just say the spirit and that works too. <laughs> so it's, it's a Trinitarian thing in the sense that you can just equivocate like that between the persons because they are doing the same thing. Um, but how does the spirit intercede for us? Okay, start with this, a problem. We have weakness. We do not know what to pray for as we ought. Um, I would, and I'm, breathe, I'm connecting in an idea that's not explicit, but we don't know the will of God. So how do we pray as we ought because we don't know his will? This actually really helped me, and this is an idea I'm still trying to untease here, or try to develop more fully in my mind. Um, but, you know, you have these passages in 1 John and elsewhere that we'll talk about. Uh, we have the things that we ask or our prayers have been answered. You know, it's kind of, you know that you have the things you ask because you pray according to the will of God. And um, it's kind of these these promises, right? If you ask according to his will, then it's certain. And we know that we have those things. Um well, with that kind of framework, I've, I've always been a little, a little bothered. Okay, yes, we, we need to pray according to God's will, but we don't necessarily know what it is. And uh, I don't know if you've ever found yourself doing this in prayer. You know, you have some situation. Uh, recently, a person here in the church, and he, he had he con uh, contracted COVID, and he was, I think, three or four weeks in the hospital. And so we're praying for him. And I can find myself praying, uh, Lord, would you do this? Could you allow it to work out like this? And I'm kind, I realize that I'm kind of like dictating a story of how I would like it to work. You know, <laughs> you could do this and then you could do that and you could do that. You know, I'm kind of like laying out a scenario for the Lord. Um, and you start to realize, like, why am I doing this? <laughs> I don't need to lay out a scenario <laughs> for how he could do this thing. Uh, he has in and he has infinite num an infinite number of colors to paint with, and so I don't I don't need to like provide for him a here's here's a little plan step one step two step three see that works nicely, um I don't need to do that, but I find my I catch myself doing that, uh okay swing around to the opposite side it, here's a man and he was on death door I'll I'll give it away he did he died, um the funeral was last week so anyway um he's in a very difficult situation on death's door. And so you can find yourself praying something, alternatively something like, um, please heal this man. Uh, but if it's, I'll say it raw, okay? Um, you say, if it's his will, if it's your will that he dies, then may that be. And that's, that's raw, isn't it? Um, we are wanting to express that we want to find God's will but at the same time, do you know what I mean? Anyway, it's okay. So, and it, or maybe even more raw sometimes, it's like if you're praying for, a, let's say, a lost loved one, um, dear Lord, please save this person. I pray that this person would come to faith. But if it's your will that they perish, you know, I mean, like, who wants to say that? Um, so we're, we're struggling a little bit with talking about God's will in the sense of what he's going to do because we have no idea. And that also is problematic or troubled me with those different passages that kind of talked about our prayers. It, it, they give the impression that when you pray, they will certainly be answered. It's kind of that you kind of get that sense. Your prayers will be answered. Well, mine aren't. I pray all the time and I try to pray according to God's will and I don't see him answering according to what I asked. I asked that I, asked, I mean, we did. We prayed a lot. We asked that this man would live. He died. Okay, so... All right. So did, you know, did we pray the wrong thing or something? Um, and I think this, this framework really helped me. This is the framework I'm using for the passage or how I'm understanding it. I don't know the will of God. And so I pray in weakness. I pray in confusion. I pray all kinds of things. And, you know, I have certain things that I think, here's what I think would work out well. <laughs> here's, what I'm, here's what I'm rooting for. Here's the outcome I want. Um, and you pray that way and you pray strongly that way and you don't get the answer. 
So what happened in your prayers? Were, did, were your prayers defective? You failed to pray according to God's will and so forth. And I think my, my understanding of the passage, at least as it, understand, as it stands today, is that basically the Spirit is laundering my prayers. I mean, the Spirit is taking my prayers and, and setting them right. He who searches hearts. There is in my heart a right desire. And I, I mean, when you, know, when you pray, we're praying for this man to be healed. Why are we praying that way? Because we love him? Because as far as we humanly see it, we think it would be better for this man to continue to be and have the ministry that he had in the church for the sake of his wife. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of different reasons that we're praying. So from my human standpoint, I look at those reasons and I say, you know, seems clear enough to me. And I think the spirit searches hearts. Um, he knows my heart. God also knows the mind of the spirit. The spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And basically my prayers, in they're, they're kind of like childlike prayers. And God answers in better ways. God answers in ways that might be against what I asked for. I asked for this outcome. God knows that outcome would be better. And the spirit actually kind of repairs or adjusts or fixes my prayers. He launders my prayers. Um, I think it was Jim Berg who say, some, says something like this. Like even, even our prayers have to, be, have to be laundered on the way to the throne room of God. Um, because I, I just, I pray like a child, you know, I, well, Lord, here's what I think makes sense to me. And that's kind of the best I can do. And it's the spirit who sets things right. Now, that reading, I think, if I'm reading that correctly, fits with what follows. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And the good, as you know, the good here is defined, if you just keep on going down, with other purposes. The good is defined as being conformed to the image of his son, being glorified. So, and that is his purpose. So good, purpose, conformed to the image of his son, ultimately glorification. Um, that kind of framework that the good is not what I think is necessarily the good. What I would think was the good was for this man to be healed. God had some other purpose for him and for us and all across. And so that purpose, whatever, God's purposes are good by definition. And that good, the, the, the good as God sees it, which is the actual good versus what I think would be good, is now expressed backwards in the passage in terms of prayer. What is the will of God? The will of God language gets so complicated uh, here. Just simplify. What does God want? What is what God, what is, what is it that God wants? What God wants is the good, his purpose, that we might be made like Jesus, that we would ultimately be glorified. That's what God wants. How do we pray according to what God wants? We pray according to what God wants with the help of the Spirit. Because I'm doing my best to try to pray according to God's will, but I'm so weak and I'm so broken in my thinking, I don't even know what to ask. And the spirit repairs that and sets that right. So anyway, I think that for me, that helps restore the advantages of that reading. It helps me restore the flow of thought in the passage. That It, it moves naturally from this straight into the concept of God working all things according to his purpose. It flows naturally. And it the thing that it maybe was more significant for me, it helps me um, explain some of those other prayer passages that otherwise were just honestly kind of mystifying or bothered me to talk about, you know, if we ask according to his will, he answers us. And, and if we ask like that and we see, then we know that we have whatever we ask from him. Well, I, I mean, when does it, when does it work like that? <laughs> because I ask all the time, trying to ask according to his will, trying to ask what I think would be his will. And it turns out it wasn't. <laughs> um, well, here's how. The spirit intercedes. The spirit launders my prayers and makes, makes right what was distorted in my thinking. Uh, the one other expression, or, well, there's two things, but here. Uh, expression I want to clarify here is the, fir the, the concept of the firstborn among many brethren in verse 29. Um, so just to explain that for a quick second. Uh, the firstborn among many brothers is striking because what we've got here is son language, adoption language earlier. 
Jesus is the son. We are united with him as son. What, as, as we are united with him as believers, that means we become sons, right? And so uh, we are, through union with Christ, we become related. Just the thing that's striking here is the firstborn. Firstborn is language of preeminence. The firstborn among many brothers. And I think what's striking about the language is uh, Jesus is the son of God. By our connection to Jesus, we are made sons. But it is not as though then this results in equality that I have now the same standing with God that Jesus has. There is still the sense that he is the firstborn among many. Right. And so he's unique. He's the unique son. I am together with him as a son. I become a son in him, but he as the unique one. <laughs> so I think that's the language of the firstborn among many brothers. And that, that, that's supported by the word firstborn. You can follow out, chase out the word, but the word firstborn is kind of the unique one or the one that stands out. Um, there's more going on with that. And that word is actually under a lot of discussion right now, but that's at least part of the, a, a sufficient understanding of it. Okay, so then what should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Um, here, I'll show it to you this way because this helped me just highlighting my way through. But I thought this was interesting. If you notice, it's a little faint. Hopefully it comes through on the screens. But uh, I, just, I just put blue on each one of the question marks. So anyway, you, you get this. What then shall be here? What shall we say? Who can be against us? Will he not also graciously give us all things? Who can bring any charge against God's elect? Who is to condemn? Who shall separate us? Shall any of these things separate us? Anyway, so it's very clear, rhetorically speaking, that in this section, he jumps over into questions. Questions are the way that he moves forward through this section. It's also, I think, striking in this section. I, I highlighted oops, I highlighted in the blue here uh, because it's 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 filling out this, the brothers up here and those and those. Well, if you come down, then it turns to us. If God is for us, against us, us all, us all. And the us eventually turns into we, which is just an English change. There's no significance to it. Um, but anyway, it's very evident now that the connection goes our relationship with God. How is that possible? Or how that fits in here? Um, and I'll just comment here in terms of like, well, let's say particularly this expression uh, right here. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justified. Who can condemn? I mean, just put that in the context of the earlier Pauline stuff that was going on, like back in 116 and stuff like that. The wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of truth uh, of, of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Um, how can God both justify be just and justify sinners. All have sinned. And that Romans 3, 10 through whatever it is, that section where you just have the the all of the passages, you know, there's none righteous, there's no not one, all have together become unprofitable. And you just, you get the sense that whole theme in the early sections of we're a mess. God must righteously judge us because of what a total mess we are. And then look at the contrast of that. Who can bring any charge against God's elect? God justifies. I mean, the very one who earlier was our threat, the wrath of 116 has now given way to be a total defense of absolute safety. Um, in these verses, uh, Cranfield says this, who shall bring any charge against God's elect, is he calls that a, a perfect summary of the gospel of Romans. And I, I think that's great. Um, uh, sums up the gospel of Romans. Who can bring any charge against those who are gods? It can't happen. Uh, one or two other details that are striking in here. Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he also not also with him give graciously give us all things? There are strong echoes in that of Isaiah 53. Um, Isaiah 53 verse 6. 10, 12, and here I'll put it up so you can see what I'm talking about. But the language, okay, so get a good look at that. Uh, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? 
Um, and now compare that here with the Isaiah 53 language. Here you have the all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The, but no, the details I'm calling out are the all, but also that the Lord has laid on him. Verse 10, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. The Lord has put him to grief. Um, and then verse, 50, verse 12, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he bore the sin of many and he makes intercession for the transgressors. So if I'm going back now to this language, which kind of functions almost like a summary of some of those statements, what I've got here is here's the all language. He, he gave him up for us all. The imputation language of Isaiah 53 is in that. And the result of that is he, I will divide with him the portion of the many, the spoil of the strong. That's this. He will give us the spoil, the results, the blessings of it. And then here is the language of it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It was, it was God who put him to grief or the, the concepts of saying that who they say something like who killed Jesus. And you can, you can walk through this. Well, you know, the Romans killed Jesus in a way. The Jews killed Jesus. Yeah, in a way. But uh, ultimately, you can say, I killed Jesus. It was my sins that sent him there. Um, but in a, a way where you're going to come ultimately is the Father and the wrath of God is what led to Jesus' death, God's righteous wrath for sin. And notice the language of verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up, God sent Jesus to the cross. God sent Jesus to the cross so that I can receive all of these blessings. <laughs> um, so it's God, the Father, who has the agency in this. The result of it is for the all or for the many. And, the, and, the, and, the, and that result is the, the blessings of the spoils, the riches. And if I want to ask what are those riches or what do they look like, then that's what the rest of the passage fills out. Here are the blessings. It's, it's the blessings of this. You know, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Nothing can say, that is the spoils, that is the blessings. Those blessings that were won at this cost, God giving up his son. So anyway, with that as, as background and context, I just, I think the passage really, it sings. It, it uh, yeah, anyway, you can't get through it without being astounded at the beauty of the passage. All right, I said I would go a little over and it's 816. So let's uh, let's just come back at come uh, 817, make that. Uh, let's come back at 822 or a little bit after uh, 20 minutes, 20, 22, 23 minutes after the hour. And then we'll pick up in chapter nine. So starting question for chapter nine is just, I think initially to ask why I have kind of a, what do they call that? Uh, a hard cut, Sma a, a smash cut. Um, <laughs> why do you have this? Why do you have this sudden transition in the beginning of chapter nine, like a non-transition, basically? Uh, so here's what I mean by this. I mean you've gone, you know, you've had all of this framework in the the previous chapter. Well, just building up to this climax, and I'm persuaded, height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us. From the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, I mean, even here, it's kind of, this sounds like the, uh, I'm sorry, rabbit trail, but like uh, Romans 5.1 and 8.1, there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? I commented recently in another context, another teaching context, um, we almost kind of get immune to the in Christ language because it happens so much in the epistles. So we hear it so often, we just stop paying attention. We don't even notice it anymore because it's everywhere. But how do I have, how am I secure? Strictly and only in Christ Jesus. It's union with Christ that is the foundation for this. And it's just all over the place. Okay, <laughs> that's funny. The next verse, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. See, I mean, anyway, illustrate my point. Um, so, but in any case, the question I'm asking here is this is triumphant and wow, and it just ascends up to a climax and then boom, I'm speaking the truth in Christ, my conscience bearing witness that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I wish myself 
I could wish myself accursed, cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, the kin my kinsmen, according to the flesh, Israelites. So the question of chapter 9 is suddenly, yeah, but what about the Jews? And, um, uh, well, I'll build that thought out in a second. That's not exactly the question, but we'll understand it in a bit. So what is the link between these? And I think you could say validly, I mean, you know, fair enough. After you build up to this beautiful climax right here, you know, where are you going to go from there? Well, you kind of bring up a new topic. So, okay, fair enough. Um, I do think that his basic, the basic flow of thought with the questions that started out in chapter one, the wrath of God against men in unrighteousness, Jew and Gen or Gentile and Jew are both condemned. How can they be justified? And then explaining justification by faith, chapter four, through union with Christ or imputation, chapter five, what that works itself out to be in practical living, chapter six, the ongoing struggle and the paradox of the present, chapter seven, chapter eight, eschatology. Anyway, he built out those ideas. And so it's kind of you kind of have a wrap on it now. So in a sense, you, you put a wrap around that and now you come back here and you can resume the argument back here. Um, there are some links actually way back in there. There were some things that were kind of not quite totally wrapped up. And I'll show you one of those here. It's, there, there are points in the argument that weren't quite explained and he left those. So like in Romans 3, 5, if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what should we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? And Romans 3, 1 to 8 kind of explores this question, but it did not completely answer it. So there's a part of that, and, and he does this in other places too, kind of leave something out there, kind of a partial answer, but not a full answer. Well, look at the, the strong resonance in 914. What should we say? Is there injustice on God's part? This is a very, this is the same question as the question he asked up here. If our unrighteousness serves to God, what should we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict on wrath, wrath on us? Is there injustice on God's part? It's the same question. So he's resuming the question and kind of going to go deeper with it. So there's a sense of that too, that this was a question that was left back there. Um, and the question of how, how God's purposes are accomplished in the Jewish nation. So that's part of that. Uh, Schreiner also makes a link that I found helpful enough. Um, and Schreiner will say in the end of Romans 8, the, the list of blessings I got at the end, I mean, all of these rich blessings of who can separate us from the love of Christ and, and that kind of language. These blessings in here, this stuff is all stuff that I would expect if you're like Jewish, you're reading the Old Testament, you say, hey, that's our stuff. That's our blessings, right? I mean, this, hey, we're the ones that have relationship with God that's in, it, that's um, indelible and unbreakable and permanent and eternal and abiding. So uh, Shiner's argument goes, chapter 8 and talking about all these blessings, but he's talking about it for Jew and for Gentile, kind of leaves you, wait, what about the Jews? I thought these promises were made to the Jews. And in fact, just to support uh, the idea that this is kind of that the, the Jew Gentile question is at the core here, you can see just right in the, the next section, you're going to have a preponderance of Jew and Gentile, but you're going to also have specifically kind of a resumption of um, both to Jew and to Gentile language that was something that started all the way back in the beginning, back in chapter one. Uh, you set, you saw, you know, the gospel, which is for the Jew and for the Gentile. Well, that kind of language is getting picked up again here in chapter nine. In any case, um, it, let me adjust the question a little bit. Chapter nine is the question of uh, the the question of Jewish promises and how they're fulfilled. But it's a little bit more than that. And let me sharpen up the question so that we're we're getting it accurately. Let's watch it. Here, here's his anguish. How the Jews could have all of these blessings. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ who is God over all blessed forever. So these are all the promises that they have. I'll come back to that in a second. 
But here is the issue. Here's the actual issue. And the issue is, has the word of God failed? That's the question. So, I mean, the, the, the surface presenting level issue is, what about the Jews? That's like the surface level question. Will God restore the Jews? Will they experience salvation? Will the promises of God be fulfilled to the Jews? That's the presenting question. But the deeper question and the core question is really, does God say things that he doesn't fulfill? That's the deeper question. Does God make promises and does he obligate himself in ways and then he just doesn't come through? Because if that's true, he's going to argue in 9 to 11, we're all in trouble. If God could just make promises to the Jews and not fulfill them, he can make promises to me and not fulfill them. <laughs> if the Jews can have high hopes for salvation that never come through, then maybe that's what's going to happen to us. So that the core question of verse 6, that's really it. Has the word of God failed? All right, so that's what I think drives this whole section. Let me go back and just highlight one or two things in here that I want to uh, comment on. Verse 5, uh, from their race according to the flesh is the Christ who is God over all. This is an important um, like deity of Christ statement, and there's different stuff that's going on here that's really interesting with that uh, exegetically. I'll just say in case if you're ever wanting to use that like in a discussion with somebody, you're having a discussion with an Aryan or something, like I mean you would expect. They have answers to all the different proof texts that we bring up. And I'll just put over here for your interest, if you look at the New World Translation and how they handle this, uh, let me make them so same size so they are easier to read. You know, here over we we here we read according to the flesh is the Christ, or I would love to translate this as the Messiah, um, but I don't, I say that it's not like I'm saying this is a wrong translation. It's great. According to the flesh is the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever. What they're going to do with a reading over here from them, the Christ descended according to the flesh. Period. God who is over all be praised forever, new sentence. So this is just like a separate doxology. But this who is over all is not grammatically linked back. It's a separate sentence. You just, you cut it off and then you speak separately. Uh, Greek and grammatically speaking, that's fair. You can read it that way. So I'm not saying that, there are other places where I think the New World Translation just com is a complete lie. Um, in this case, that is a valid possible way of punctuating it. I think this is the stronger and there are reasons for that. There are very good grammatical reasons why it's better or stronger to go here. But this is also possible. So anyway, if you're committed to Arianism, then that's what you're going to have anyway. I'm not a huge fan in terms of um, conversations with Arians, you know, because we kind of stock our lists of uh, anti-Arian texts. And so we go in there and we throw out our proof texts and they throw out their proof texts and we throw proof texts at, at each other. and We never get anywhere. Um, I'm less of a fan of using the proof text method to try to deal with Arianism. And I, I think two things that are helpful. And one is, and maybe this is just another kind of proof texting, but I like to do intertextuality. I like to, because their distinction that they're going to do is they're always going to say, well, that's Jeho Jehovah versus Jesus. And they're going to distinguish those out. But if you'll watch and you'll find there are a ton of these, one of the recent ones that was just mind blowing to me in, we'll see it, I suppose, if we ever get there. Um, in Romans 14, there is every knee will bow to me, every tongue will confess to me. And it's tied back to Isaiah. You can look it up. I forget the number. Somebody probably will know it off the top of their head. Um, but it's tied back to Isaiah. And of course, Philippians ties that to Jesus. So in Isaiah, then it is God, it is Jehovah, to whom every knee bows and to whom every tongue confesses. And in Romans, it's also God. And in Philippians, it's Jesus. <laughs> so anyway, you can do those kinds of links. And I, I, I prefer those strongly, partially because there's tons of them, so you never run out. And partially because they aren't very familiar with them. They've already developed an answer to all of these. They're always going to say the same thing. Oh, you just need this translation of it. Um, but in these cases, it's not translational. You can just, I mean, you can go to the Old Testament in, in their New World Translation if you want. You can look across and you can see these things going on. It's just there. So I think intertextuality is some of the best answer you can give. 
And then the other answer I give, I just think the core problem with um, Arianism, if you go into the like eight or 10 proof texts that we traditionally memorize for this, you can find a way around every single proof text. There's always a way. There's always a way. And some of them are valid enough, some of them less. But there's always a way. The question is, is the weight or the preponderance of the evidence. If I'm always having to like barely squeeze through, barely squeeze through, barely squeeze through, it's the weight of it. And the core issue with Arianism is you're not trying to understand the texts, you're trying to evade the texts. But it, you, you've got to go through and actually look deeply at the texts themselves in a, with an honest concern to understand them. So um, I usually try to point them that way. I'll just, you know, hey, let's just, ha have you read the Bible? I'll say, that's a question I ought. Have you read the Bible? Depending on the group, Jehovah's Witnesses do. Uh, here in the Philippines, Iglesia Ni Cristo and Arian group, they don't. So do you read the Bible? Do you read the whole thing? Let's look at a lot of, okay, let's look at the pattern, those kinds of things. All right, um, that's one comment and I'll stop there. Uh, the other comment that I think is really interesting here in terms of the list of blessings that Paul gives here. Yes, thank you for putting that in the chat, um, pulling the references. Um, here, if you watch the refer or the list of blessings, uh, so, you know, adoption, glory, covenants, the law, the worship, the promises, patriarchs, race. But the striking thing is he ends climactically. And I, it's not accidental that the last thing in the list of blessings is the Messiah. <laughs> um, and here is, a, I think, a really good way of summarizing what is the blessing or what is the privilege of Jewishness. The privilege of Jewish, Jewishness or the, of the race is that, that the Messiah came from there. In other words, the way I summarize this, because we get, we get a little weird and superstitious about Jewishness and that kind of thing. Um, and the way I want to summarize this is the uniqueness of the Jew, the uniqueness of Abraham, the uniqueness of all of those promises, Old Testament promises, is it all points to Christ. Because Christ is the terminus point of all of that. And Christ brings all of that together. That's the significance. The significance is connection to Christ. A person who is connected to Christ is blessed. That's the basic idea. But see, from there, it really helps us process this because, you know, I'm, I'm as far as I know, just full straight Gentile all the way. Um, so you can almost give this feeling like, well, you know, I'm second tier or something because I'm Gentile. You go, no. <laughs> Blessing is connection to Christ so much so that you can talk about privilege because somebody was the ancestor of the Messiah. That's not enough to save them, but it is privilege in a certain sense. But you are connected in union with Christ. So forget like DNA. Oh, well, you know, wouldn't I be lucky if I was an ancestor? What are you talking about? You're his child. Right? You're united. You're one with him. I mean, uh, illustrations that are going to get used for this are like marriage. Right? Christ and his church. Oneness. Imputation. So the notion that, you know, it would be really, it would just be really cool to be an ancestor of Christ is just really missing it completely. Oh, no. You're one with him. How much, how much greater is that? And that, I think, just completely wipes out any sense of you know, not being Jewish puts you on a second tier level of something in terms of salvation. It's, we're definitely not supposed to go, go that way. So um, that helps us, I think, process as far as that leads through. Okay, um, to actually, this just builds perfectly going further with that idea. Okay, so what is blessing or how would we regard blessing and how would we describe it? Oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, connection to Christ. It has the word of God failed though? And here's his answer. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Um, so I'll explain the idea in a bit, but let me just summarize it if I may, or just interpret it straight out and to say, there's no such thing as salvation by DNA. There's no such thing as a position of blessing by DNA. You, you don't get in because you have a certain ancestry. That's what his argument is. Okay, so DNA won't do it. Ancestry won't do it. 
And to illustrate that, what he's going to say here is to explain the ideas out now again. Well, I'll start with this one first. Um, not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. I think you get more explanation of this like in Galatians um, where you have the, the extended argument that to be in Abraham's faith in the line of Abraham's faith makes you more of his child than to, than to share his DNA because the more significant characteristic of Abraham is not DNA but faith. But in any case, the argument here goes you've got people that are offspring of Abraham in terms of DNA but they're, they're not part of this sense of the offspring. Not all who are descended necessarily belong to the category of the blessing. And he illustrates that kind of interestingly by showing you that you've got people who are in the DNA and it doesn't count. All right, so here the argument goes through, you know, the promise was through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Well, there was another one wasn't there. Ishmael. So it was there, there was Ishmael and there was Isaac. There was another guy who was a child of Abraham, but he was not part of this link to the offspring, to the seed. He was not part of the link to the blessing. Somebody says, okay, yeah, but Ishmael, yeah, descendant of Abraham granted, but not like full all the way because it was right. It was Abraham and his servant. So it was kind of mm, that. So let's talk, you know, if you go full-blooded Abraham and Sarah, all of those people are in. Well, no, actually he processes this out because uh, here's, okay, this is the promise with Isaac, but not only so, we can go further down the chain, fine. Rebecca had children by one man, but the by one man language here, I think is, you know, it's going to, um, kind of contrast with Abraham because Abraham, you have two different women. In the case of Rebecca, same father, same mother, okay, same parents. And in their case, there was a division. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And if you follow this out, right? I mean, we're talking about, remember the language up here? Um, the language up here was not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Well, I mean, what's striking here is you've got full-blooded descendants of Abraham, Full-blooded descendants of Isaac. Nothing, I don't know, in terms of DNA going on or something. Full-blooded descendants. But when we talk about Israel, what we mean are Jacob and his sons. That's actually what we're talking about. So, I mean, Abraham has other children. And if you're framing that out, then what we talk about Israel is Jacob and his sons. But, you know, actually, there's, there's more going on here. Abraham had children before that some of whom are not really counted in terms of this promise. So his argument in this initial section is to say, DNA isn't going to do it. <laughs> DNA is not going to be sufficient at all. Um, okay. Yes, good. Uh, different good thoughts here in the chat. Thank you, good, good comments and discussion. Um, one or two things to say about that then uh here this final statement verse 32 as it is written jacob have i loved uh esau have i hated um that excuse me i'm trying to pull the reference up for you here i have it in my notes and i don't remember it is uh that's drawn from malachi 1 2 and 3. um that is uh that there's an explanation that you can give if you want here in terms of hated versus loved it could, it, you know, hated is probably really strong English. Um, probably the idea is kind of a preferred sort of thing. So you can soften that down some. But however you do here, I think this is a this is an important argument to me. However you try to soften those things down so it doesn't bother us so much, it still has to lead to this question. What will we say then is there injustice on God's part? By no means. This is another one of the you know, the recurring pattern with Paul, the by no means you led, you went to the wrong conclusion kind of, uh, of argument. But in any case, if you go up here and you do various strategies to take away the sting of this, you don't end up here. So my argument basically goes, whatever, whatever led Paul logically to this, yeah, but this doesn't feel right. 
This feels unfair. It has to be basically served by this. This somehow, a logical extension of this, an invalid logical extension, but still, an extension of this leads here. So anyway, we do a lot of people make a lot of efforts to try to kind of take away the sting of this. And you'll do different things like what we're talking about is not individual election, it's corporate election as in its nations or its groups. Um, I don't think that's valid. I do think the argument in this section is God has purposes. And in those purposes, I mean, it really was he, he, he chose in his purposes that it's it's going to be Jacob, not Esau. And I, when you, I think when you go back and you read those narratives in Genesis, it's very much supported by the narratives. In the narratives you're reading along, there's two children. One of them is the one that the blessing goes down that direction, and it goes it goes down the direction of Jacob, and it doesn't go down the other way. And it's it's hardly like you would read the Jacob story and say. Yeah, and it's because Jacob is a really good guy. I mean, you're not getting that sense at all from Jacob. So what's going on here? And it, it, God has a bigger purpose. There's stuff, you know, in his plan, in his purpose of election, there's stuff that's standing. Um, the language of sovereignty or of his choice is so strong here. God's purpose of election, him who calls. Um, there's the language earlier up here, promise. But anyway, the sense of his his determination, his setting, this is the way it's going to go. So anyway, I understand the sting of this. And we want to kind of pull that off a little bit. Um, but don't pull it off in such a way, however you read up here, that this question doesn't make any sense. Oh, this is all just corporate. You know, no, no. I mean, when you get that, it still Paul's, hey, does this not bother you? <laughs> um, there is a, it's natural and right that you're going to feel, hey, this doesn't seem fair. And now he's going to explain it out a little bit more. Um, so some of this, we get into some intertextuality. Uh, here he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. That's a quote from Exodus 33, 19. Context on that, here I can put it up. Um, this is the place where Moses says, please show me your glory. God declares his glory. I will make my goodness pass before you. The Lord, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Um, so it's it's not just like a really uh, like a little passing detail somewhere. I mean, this is like a core systematic theology. Who is God? What is his nature? God reveals his nature and his nature is like this. I'm gracious. I'm merciful but I'm sovereign. That's part of how God, a core part or a core aspect of how God is revealing himself in that text. Um, and that's where this Romans 9 language is drawn from in verse 15, when he says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Um, keep on going with the language of that. Then we're getting into comparison to the, the Pharaoh story. The scripture says to Pharaoh, I have raised you up that I might show my power, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That's another point of intertextuality. Uh, I think, he, well, anyway, you can look that one up. That, that context is not going to be as immediately obvious, but are as immediately striking. But if you read the Exodus story, it's very strong in the Exodus story. God has a purpose in the whole Pharaoh Exodus scenario. He's going to do some things that are ultimately going to result in the nations knowing his glory. And I mean, you can chase this out in Exodus. You know, it, you realize God is doing this not just for the sake of Pharaoh, not just for the sake of Egypt, but the nations abroad are going to hear of it and they're going to know about God's glory. And when you get later into like Israel entering the land, then the nations come to them and they say things like, we have heard about what God did. <laughs> Um, and therefore we're afraid. So, I mean, God has these broad, like international worldwide kind of purposes, things that he's doing through the Exodus in that context. And uh, all of that is at work in his purposes. So I think even that kind of gives you this, the beginnings of some answer here, which are to say, God has big purposes going on that are way bigger than you can imagine. And he, he's working those purposes that stretch further and further out definitely beyond our ability to comprehend and so forth. Um, in any case, 
What is the answer? I mean, the answer, is there injustice on God's part? The basic answer in here is God's in charge. I mean, his sovereignty, uh, his, uh, his, his right to do what he intends. Um, you see language like here, verse 16, it's kind of a, a classic text. It depends not on human will or exertion, but God who has mercy. God, God is driving according to his purposes. He's working according to his purposes. I, we don't want to try to, we don't want to try to wiggle around any of these texts. It's just there. It stands. Um, it's there. Uh, language that's in here, I do think that's interesting, like show might be proclaimed. And there's one more that I forget. Um, I don't see it right now. But anyway, it's the sense of God displaying or God demonstrating his glory. So that's some of what's going on. Again, I think the logic and that reading of it, read this as it stands. Don't try to like slide around it somewhere or something because it has to lead to this question. Verse 19, if it, if it didn't make you feel this way, I don't know that you got it. If you got the section correctly, it has to make you feel like, well, why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? So, I mean, anyway, any reading up here that just goes, oh, okay, we're not really talking about the idea that uh, God would be sovereignly directing things according to his purpose. Something else goes going on here. Leaves you with this question not making any sense. But, I mean, I, I think an honest reading up here gets me to verse 19. Why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? And it's it has to lead there if we're going to read it uh, fairly as we go. Um, there was something else I missed in here that I wanted to uh, comment on. Yes, <laughs> it's kind of striking to me just to say here, uh, the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you. Um, the fair, So if you're processing this, he's alluding to Pharaoh as the hard heart that's resisting God. And the argument goes, you know, how can God righteously condemn, look, here's the person, the, the, the rebel. In context in Romans 9, who is the rebel that we're struggling with or that we're having a tough time with? The rebel in the context of Romans 9, you know, going back up here, it's the Israelites. And so the question we're asking here is, has the word of God failed because you've got Jews, Jewish people that are rebels? And ironically, I just think it's striking. When you get down here, the, the paradigmatic rebel, Pharaoh, uh, actually, ironically, has become paralleled with the Jew. <laughs> um, so the, the irony of that is it can't, can't be missed. You know, Pharaoh, the enemy of the Jews, kind of the stereotypical enemy of the Jews. But now Paul is drawing from here, Pharaoh, the ultimate rebel. And he's saying, and, and this gives me an explanatory grid for understanding why Jewish people today are rejecting. Uh, they're lining themselves up with Pharaoh, <laughs> um, which is just, anyway, there's a thick irony in that, I think. Okay, so the next section, uh, verse 19 to 20, why does he still find fault? How, who can resist his will? And part of the answer, we're still on the same framework here. The answer is God's sovereignty. God's in charge. Uh, the language here, there's it's not exactly intertextuality, but it is reference to um, some Old Testament precedent. So Isaiah 29, 16, shall the potter be regarded as the clay? I guess it is more, I mean, it is basically intertextuality. That the thing would say of its maker, he did not make me. Or the thing formed would say of him. So anyway, there's language in here that's close enough. We can call it intertextuality. Isaiah 45, 9, woe to him who strives with him who formed him. <laughs> um, a pot is fighting back against its molder. The, does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Your work has no handles. I don't like what you're doing. Um, and Isaiah, down through Isaiah 40, 11, the work of my hands language. And then Jeremiah, Jeremiah 18 is an illustration of that where Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house. He sees the thing being made. And then God actually takes the potter. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. He uses that as an, a direct illustration. So anyway, you've got three really strong passages that are taking, and I can, if you wanted that, I can put it in the chat, that are taking this exact illustration and using it in the Old Testament. So he's hardly, he's hardly, hardly inventing something new when he goes down this direction. Um, a couple of things or ways that we, you know, people will want to kind of mm, around the passage because it's, 
understandably uh, troubling a bit. Um, so here, get it back up here. Um, so sometimes people do things like here, let's look at this, uh, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Or here's the one I was looking for, that one vessel for honorable use, another for dishonorable use. Uh, people will try to make some attempt to do honorable, dishonorable, not as believer, unbeliever, but kind of like, uh, I don't know, favored or you know, blessed believer versus not so much blessed believer or something. You can't do that. Um, if you just look at the language, you, just, you can just do the words and search for the words. Um, there are a number of reasons why we're just, we're just talking about believers and unbelievers here. So 2 Timothy 2, 19 to 21 uh, is that's talking about um, fa faithful and false ministers. And that's a, a reasonable parallel for this. In Romans 2, 7 and 10, you have the concept of a vessel for honor and dishonor. Anyway, it's just talking about believers and unbelievers. That's it. So maybe what I'll end here or end with here is a question of, and here's the, the, the maybe the most troubling or the, the biggest difficulty of this. The question goes, is there double predestination in this passage? Because I've got a couple of different ways through here that it sounds like it. By double predestination, what we mean, you know, I think we as humans, we're more comfortable with an idea that God sovereignly saves certain people. The thing that feels really uncomfortable is that God sovereignly damns or condemns certain people. You know, you were made to be destroyed. Um, wow. So is there, a double, is there a double predestination in this passage? And, you know, like Mu, Schreiner, they'll just go that way. Um, Calvin. Calvin is Calvin's careful, but you know Calvin, yeah, Calvin believed it. Um, so yeah, they'll just they're just gonna go that way. And like Schreiner will say, you can't you can't elude it, you can't get around it in the passage. Um, so I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm I am going to <laughs> basically avoid not go that direction. Um, and maybe someone would feel like I'm eluding what the passage is saying. I don't think so. I think I have reasons to say that Paul himself doesn't want to go there. But let me show you first the statements that sound like it. Verse 17, uh, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you. I mean, that sounds perilously close to the idea, God raised you to destroy you. Uh, verse 18, he has mercy on whoever he wills, whoever he wills, he hardens. So that sounds like a double predestination, because it sounds like um, it's symmetrical, right? He has mercy, he hardens. So it's symmetrical, the two sides. The, the, the good side, anyway, the justifying side and the condemning side. Um, and then just a bit later, that's filled out even more. Has not the potter right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use, another for dishonorable use? So there's the sense of a person is made for the dishonorable use. Dishonorable use meaning condemnation. So the vessel is made for that. What if God desiring to show his wrath to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? All right. So anyway, you've got language in here that sounds like it's going that direction uh, pretty strongly. And, you know, here prepared beforehand for his glory, that as a parallel for prepared for destruction. Um, so that's that. How would I handle these or how do I understand each one of these? For starters, let's go back here to the Pharaoh language. Um, there's an interesting pattern here with he hardens whomever he wills. Um, this has to be read in the context of the quote that was just made. I might show my power in you and Pharaoh, um, the concept of his hardening Pharaoh. So this is, that, this is commentary on the Pharaoh story. And I don't, I, I can't take you back to the Exodus passage and show you the pattern. But it is interesting when you read the Exodus pattern, there is, I think, demonstrably, it convinces me, and I've written about it, so I'm happy to share it. I'll, I can put it up um, in the Google Classroom. But um, I think there's a reasonable pattern to say, Pharaoh hardens his heart, hardens his heart, hardens his heart. And after the recurring Pharaoh hardened his heart, eventually it says God hardened his heart. In other words, I think it's demonstrable or I, I can get there to say 
Pharaoh acted first and eventually God says, okay, and confirms what Pharaoh did. So did God harden his heart? Yes. In response to what Pharaoh did initially, and eventually I, I put this in the fra framework of God saying, okay, there you go. Now, I, I'm going to maintain, yeah, God's judicial hardening, God, God confirming the process. Um, I'm going to maintain that there is no, what do you say, human will has no independent ultimacy in the universe. In other words, I'm not giving in this in, in this sense like, so then Pharaoh acted outside of the control of God. That's horrifying too. I don't, I, I don't and I can't live in a universe where things just can spiral out of control. God sits in heaven and says, oh no, this one's outside of my hands. So it's, it's not that I'm solving the problem of evil by putting that strictly and only and entirely into the hands of Pharaoh. And I, and I say, God sat in heaven and was shocked by what happened. Human agency has no ultimacy outside of the sovereign hand of God. But I do still think the pattern in Exodus there is there intentionally to say it's not that God is an actor for evil. I think that also is that goes off the rails too. God caused the evil. God is the source of the evil. So the, the blame for this is not uh, placed in Pharaoh's hands independent of the sovereignty of God, nor is it given to God. God did the evil. You can't go there either. Um, to continue my argument and, tr and, and trying to talk away from double predestination. I mean, if this was stated right here, make one of the same lump, one vessel for honorable use, another vessel for dis dishonorable use. If this was stated something like God made people, some for honorable, some for dishonorable use, I would say, well, there's double predestination, we're done. But this is part of the illustration so, I mean, the illustration, the potter makes a vessel for honorable use. The potter makes a vessel for dishonorable use. Paul doesn't quite go there to say, and so God makes people some for dishonorable use, some for honorable use. He doesn't quite go there. And you could say, well, no, look, verse 22, there it is. God has taken the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. I mean, maybe this is a passive and so you can say, and like Schreiner will say, it's a divine passive. So he'll just understand it as God prepared vessels for destruction. Still, I think it's just interesting. I mean, I think Paul's choice of a passive here leaves the agency ambiguous. I'm not saying that God is not, God is the creator. So I'm not saying that God is not in control. I don't deny that he is in control of everything that happens. I've already talked about that a moment ago. But he stops short of saying, God did it. Down here, he provides, it's active down here. He has prepared beforehand the vessels of mercy. And I think it's striking or interesting that when speaking of, a, of the positive side, he'll use active. When speaking of the negative side, he uses passive. They were prepared. He has endured with much patience vessels of wrath, which were prepared for destruction. So there's an asymmetry here. He will say down here, God is the agent. He will say up here, it, it, it was prepared without specifying that God did it. God is the agent. And I think theologically speaking, he's avoiding the statement that God is the actor, that God is the doer of the evil. <laughs> because you don't, you don't want to say that. Um, so where I end up with this in this passage is... Yes, there is no ultimate agency to human human choices outside of God's sovereign will. Um, at the same time, Scripture consistently stays short, steps short or stops short of saying that God acted to cause evil. God does not cause evil, and how those two fit together, you're you're not going to make those fit together. Not not in this lifetime. Um, that's a topic for another discussion. But like Leighton Talbert's not by chance. I could share the chapter of my own dissertation, and I went in with this um, and just explored this. Uh, D.A. Carson has a book here that is going to go through these questions: sovereignty and divine responsibility, or divine sovereignty and human responsibility. And you're you're they're there, the pieces are there, but not in a way that you can completely collapse together. You don't want to go off the rails to say human beings can act outside of God's sovereignty, nor that God is the cause or the agent standing behind evil. Um, 
can we argue that God in his omniscient knowledge knew some vessels would be for honor and others would not? I, I don't, that to me is not a helpful solution. I, there's something thicker going on in the sense, I, I, I mean, it's not just that he knows what will happen, but he's actually, he's the, he is the agent behind the positive side of it. He is the agent behind my salvation. Um, so the concept of knowledge kind of like backs him off a little bit. But it, it's still, if he knows it, it's still, it's still determinative, <laughs> you know. So, you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. So I don't personally go there. Some people do that through the, the for new language. Um, but I, I do think there's something more definitive or binding than just knowing. So anyway, this is a bad point to end today. I'm sorry. Uh, it's kind of whatever. But anyway, we'll we'll come back on this next time and we'll continue out chapter nine. And it, it does move us in a direction that is, uh, it leaves your heart rejoicing. It's the end, verse 33, where I wanted to get uh, this stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So anyway, we'll pick that up next time. Thank you for your time. Thank you for letting me go over a bit. And um, if you have further questions, we can stay in touch here. And then I will put up just when we're done here, I'll go ahead and create the PDF of that reading on Romans. And I think you'll I think you'll enjoy it and benefit from it. So okay. Thank you all. Have a good have a good day or a good evening. <laughs>